Welcome back to Module 5. In this section, we're going to be talking about stars as they live their lives on the main sequence. So we'll be talking about the vocabulary and what determines a star's normal lifetime. Let's get started. So in our previous lectures, uh, especially right before the discussion of exoplanets, we were introducing the ideas that although we can um, kind of determine all of these star properties, what really matters is that stars are not the same over their entire lives. And we introduced in a previous lecture section the HR diagram. Now, this graph here on the slide is showing us a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, but it is indicating stars as they form. And we determine the starting point for a star when a star goes from being a protostar to being a fully turned on star as the point at which hydrogen to helium fusion turns on. That is the defining characteristic of a star. When that happens, the location of the star on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram will be on the main sequence. And because it has just formed, it's just been born, we call that the zero age main sequence. Now, all of these different tracks with their different timelines represent stars of different masses. For a hundred solar mass star, we can see time points for a hundred years, a thousand years, and it takes about 10,000 years to turn on from that initial protostar cloud. On the other side of the um, graph, we see a 0.1 or a tenth of a solar mass star, so a star that is 10 times smaller in mass than the sun. And we can see time points for a million years and a hundred million years before it even becomes a star. It is such a slow process compared to that 100 solar mass star. And it is also worth recognizing that when we go directly left on the main sequence, uh, on the HR diagram towards that main sequence for the 100 solar mass star, as it is moving directly left, staying the same brightness while heating up, it has to be physically getting smaller, otherwise it would get, be getting too bright. And for the tenth of a solar mass star, the 0.1 solar mass star, as it moves on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram straight down towards the main sequence, it is staying at roughly the same temperature but getting less and less bright, which means it is getting smaller and smaller. And in fact, all of these tracks are showing us ways that stars, during their protostar phase, get smaller, they condense down in order to get their cores hot and dense enough to turn fusion on. Now, all main sequence stars have active hydrogen fusion, and for the sun, we talked about the details of the proton-proton chain. That's shown on the left. We realized that although there's a lot of steps going on, four hydrogen atoms turn into one single helium-4 uh, atom, and we get excess energy. Higher mass stars use the CNO cycle on the right. This is a cycle where each of these steps happens very quickly, but in the end, we still get four hydrogen and one helium with the same total amount of energy coming out. So why could it be, why might it be that higher mass stars use the CNO cycle? So take a moment if you wanna to try to think about it. And the, the simplest answer is that Higher mass stars, because they have more of a gravitational pull trying to collapse them down, need to push back with a faster rate of fusion. The CNO cycle is more efficient, it's more effective, it is faster, and therefore it is going to be what higher mass stars need in order to push back against gravity. The CNO cycle needs a uh, higher temperatures, higher densities, and so lower mass stars simply don't have the environment available to use it. Uh, and so it's, it's this kind of naturally occurring better system for stars that need that better system. Now we learned about this balance for the sun and I want to remind us of it because it is essential to all of the discussion we're going to have for the rest of module five. Stars are in constant balance between the inward pull of, of gravity and the outward push of pressure. 
balance is called hydrostatic equilibrium. If it's not in our notes or it doesn't sound familiar to us, let us add it to our notes now because it is such an important distinction, such an important concept for us. Because all stars, no matter their mass, are turning hydrogen into helium, so we have a set knowledge of that pressure out and the mass is determining how that works, on the main sequence, because it's the same kind of balance that we care about, there is this very thin line that we can find stars on, and we call that thin line the main sequence. Now we learned in section 4.6 in our previous module that we study binary stars so that we can get a uh, relationship between the mass of a star and its luminosity that works for main sequence stars only. So when we look at an HR diagram like this one, that upper left corner of the main sequence, those O and B main sequence stars, they're a lot more luminous, which means they have a lot more mass. Because they have a lot more mass, they need to have that faster fusion rate, and that means that they're going through their, uh, their fuel so much faster. And we could say all of the opposite statements for the red dwarfs in that bottom right corner. So let's think about how we can test those ideas and how we know that that's actually going to be the case. So in a general way, I want us to think about the big picture question here. If we are comparing high mass stars and low mass stars, what, what do we expect for their lifetimes? So I want you to pause and think what you would answer to the question on the slide. All right, so the more massive main sequence star has a bigger fuel tank, but in order to fight against gravity, it goes through that fuel so much faster. It's kind of like thinking about the fuel efficiency of a giant pickup truck and a little fuel efficient sedan. Although we have a bigger fuel tank, it's that fusion rate that really uh, kicks us in the end. And so more massive stars live a very short amount of time. They form very quickly, they go through their fuel very quickly, and then they're done. We can check this. It's not just a guess. We can check this by looking at a whole bunch of stars, various types of stars, various masses that all formed at the same time, kind of like following um, a kindergarten class of children, all sorts of different children, but they all start at the same age. We just kind of follow and progress and watch them, watch them grow and change. Now, when we look at the main sequence, and we now are tracking where stars leave and when they leave, how old they are when they, when they exit, this is the kind of um, numbers that we expect from our theories. So a half solar mass star we see exiting and we don't even have time points. A solar mass star, so that's a star like the sun, is still right near the zero age main sequence at seven billion years. And it's only at about 10 billion years that it actually really starts to leave the main sequence and become a larger, cooler star. And then a 15 solar mass star, we can see that it leaves at 10 million years and it's zooming over at 11 million um, and at 12 million, it's, it's really off in the corner as a giant or super giant. So we want to be able to test this. Star clusters become extremely useful to astronomers because they formed at the same time, that allows us to see what stars are doing which things at the same starting point, and they're the same distance away. And that becomes very useful to observational astronomers because as long as we know they're all the same distance away, their apparent brightness is gonna be directly related to their true brightness, even if we do not know that distance. And that's key. We can actually study star clusters and use them extremely effectively, even if we do not have a good determination of their overall distance away from Earth, which is pretty impressive. So the two types of star clusters that we're gonna study really are based on how many stars are there. And they have different properties because of the way that these star clusters tend to form. So the first type of cluster is called an open cluster. 
We talked in um, two videos ago about the cluster of stars forming in the central region of the Orion Nebula. They will form an open cluster. They are in the process of forming an open star cluster. A few dozen stars, maybe a hundred stars, uh, but not, not an uncountable number. We could sit here and count every point. They don't last very long in the sense that uh, gravity isn't very strong, so they'll get dispersed by just having different objects pass near-ish uh, and pull them apart. Uh, the one shown here is called the Jewel Box, quite beautiful, just a couple, a handful of really bright, uh, kind of uh, interesting looking stars. And then the other type of star cluster is a globular cluster or a globular cluster. Both uh, determinations or uh, descriptions are, are reasonable. And the one shown here is Omega Centauri, one of the largest star clusters that exists out there. On the left, we have an overall shot of the um, globular cluster. There are hundreds of thousands of stars here, and they have a wide variety of um, overall colors. And when we zoom in, we see that uh, red stars really dominate the overall color, both at large bright ones and smaller um, reddish ones. And they are much older overall. Now we're going to try to watch this uh, animation that's linked here in the slides. So I'm going to get that loaded and I'll see you there. We are going to watch this uh, video and I'm going to pause it a couple of times so I can say what I'd like to. We're taking that image from the slides and we're zooming in so that there's a countable number of stars for us to explore. And there's going to be a couple of questions that I want to ask you and you can pause our larger video in order to answer them. As we watch this current motion, what we're doing is having a computer separate all of the points of light and start to sift them and sort them by certain uh, properties. So right now we're seeing all of the points shift left and right. And as that process finishes, I want you to think about what is the computer sorting by? So that's the question I want you to think about right now. What is the computer currently sorting by horizontally? Now, before we continue, what I want us to recognize is we have a lot of astronomy knowledge in our brains already. We've been in this class, we've been thinking about a lot of different things in a lot of different ways, and we are currently smarter than this computer is. The computer was only asked to sort by the color on the screen, like the color of the pixels, basically, where the bluest uh, points of light went to the left, the reddest points of light went to the right, and we can see this statement we've made in the past where there are no green stars. Stars are blue and then they're white when they're kind of still pretty bright, then yellow, then orange, and then red when they're the coolest. So these were sorted by color. If you answered temperature, you're already thinking ahead. You are thinking more and better than the, tells the computer is but the computer only knew to sort by color. So as we answer this next question, again, you can think about what it means, but also start with what is the computer sorting by? So now vertically, what is the computer, the one that's not very smart, the computer doesn't know as much astronomy as we do, what is the computer sorting by vertically? So it turns out the computer is sorting by the size of the point but we want to recognize that the size of the point is related to the apparent brightness of the stars. The bigger points are just brighter than the other stars. They are not physically larger. We can't say for sure that they are physically la larger. They're just taking up more pixels because of their brightness. And now that we have this overall uh, HR diagram, we see that the main sequence is still intact for the lower half of it, but there is this branch where stars seem to be leaving the main sequence to become red giant stars. That horizontal branch goes beyond our curriculum goals for introductory astronomy, but certainly we, we do care that these stars are going to end up as white dwarfs. And as we put all of those points back, we recognize that all of these stars are in this cluster interspersed, but we can still study those same properties. 
So as we think about star clusters, this slide here is meant to organize a bunch of different facts in case you find those interesting and engaging. Uh, I'm not expecting you to memorize all of these different things. There's a couple of terms here that are really only going to be relevant and useful when we get into module six, thinking about the structure of the galaxy. The terms halo, disk, and arms refer to different parts of our galaxy, and so I encourage you to make a note to come back to this slide when we're thinking about the structure of the galaxy uh, in module six from chapter 25. But in terms of these other numbers, I really, I really suggest that you write down what you find interesting, what you think will be useful to you because of your curiosity, not because you have a sense that you need to memorize it, because for now, we just need to know that stars form in clusters. So a typical open cluster, when we plot the HR diagram, what we expect, the um, theory on the left, is that the smallest stars, which take a very long time to finally coalesce from protostar to star, those smallest stars will take a while to get to the main sequence. So when they're not yet there, stars that are not yet on, protostars will show up above the main sequence in the bottom right corner. That indicates that a cluster is very young and still forming. A picture of the cluster that we actually look at is here in the middle, and on the far right is the HR diagram of actual star data showing us that our simulation is on track. On the other hand, a globular star cluster, similar to the one that we explored, Omega Centauri, although we're going to think about another one here, uh, we see all of those young uh, stars already formed, and now we are fast forwarding to a much longer period of time where all of the highest mass stars have gone through their whole life cycles. And we said already that the most massive stars we expect to die first, they have to go through their fuel. And we do, we see that whole upper left part of the chart completely gone. And the HR diagram that we see here on the far right of the screen uh, is very similar to what we were looking at with the Omega Centauri video. So we see this turnoff point where we are leaving the main sequence and heading towards red giants. We can use that main sequence turnoff point, that term, main sequence turnoff point, we can use that to identify the overall age of the star cluster. It shows us which stars are just starting to run out of hydrogen in their cores and are about to leave the main sequence. Uh, and again, this is very different than the protostars that are not yet formed. We're always looking in the upper left corner. We're trying to find where that main sequence turnoff point is as it shifts further and further down the main sequence itself. So what's happening, just to make sure that we kind of wrap up this uh, summary and discussion with uh, the, the key facts. Along the main sequence, stars go from very high luminosity and very high mass in the upper left corner of the HR diagram to very low luminosity and very low mass in the lower right part of the diagram. That mass-luminosity relationship works for main sequence stars. High mass stars have to push against more gravity, so they have to have a much higher rate of fusion. They use up their fuel much faster highest mass stars have the shortest lifetimes. So once they use up all of their fusion, they have to leave the main sequence. And what we're starting to want to wonder, I hope that we're starting to wonder, is why do they go back into that upper right corner? Why do they get big again? That's going to be the big topic of our next video. So we want to know in our next video, so that we don't cover too much all at once, we want to know what causes stars, when they leave the main sequence, to become giants and supergiants. Why is all of a sudden, why are they all of a sudden kind of puffing up when what we're thinking is that they're running out of fuel and so gravity is going to start to win? So the next section is what happens to the last 10% of a star's lifetime because they spend about 90% of their lifetime on the main sequence, happy and alive, turning hydrogen into helium. So there's a lot of cool things that happen coming up. So I will see you in that next video. Thanks for watching.